if God is doing a new thing in our day, are we ready to receive it? I know we all want to say yes. But I have such a sense in my spirit as we were worshipping that in the last moments that sometimes we hang on to stuff that we grew up with it or, you know, maybe you encountered God somewhere or something, you know, in your journey, even as a Christian, and, and you came to some form of revelation or whatever, and you, you cling to that so much that, that you are missing what God is doing now. The awesome thing about God, can you take this mic slightly down? It is a bit loud. The awesome thing about God is that we cannot figure him out. That is almighty, all-powerful, incredible creator. And for us to box him in a way that, you know, God, I experienced like you like this five years ago or ten years ago, is actually not a good idea. And I believe hinders us from experiencing him right here, right now. So now as we, we're sitting here this morning, I mean, there, there's a variety of, of ways that you've walked with the Lord and things that you've encountered and, you know, maybe um, you have so, had some not so nice experiences in church um, and, 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 you know, that makes you back off a bit. But can I encourage you to embrace what God is doing now? For each one of us to pursue Him in such a way that we're laying our lives before Him fully saying, Father, have your way. Have your way with this life. And I believe as we healed, you know, that song uh, that we sang about, you know, um, new wine. Um, there's a crushing that happens. Organ can tell us all about it. Now, organ, the grapes are not happy. They are being pressed and squashed and stuff and there's stuff happening to get to the wine. He's a winemaker, by the way, just for... He doesn't, he's not at home stepping on grapes the whole day, but, um, but there's a process. And here's the thing, if we want to embrace what God has in store for us in the season, we need to allow him to maybe shape and, and move us and, and, and cut off a few things. And, you know, when that pruning comes in that, maybe he's busy with that in your life. But they see yielding to him saying, Father, have your way. In my life. And, and I can tell you in the last, even through the fast, um, and the fast was great. And, and there was a couple of words in the fast where, you know, there's God is breaking down walls. God is restoring. He's doing new things. And, you know, saints, as the living stones, we need to heal to what the builder wants to build. He wants to build us into his house, not our idea of his house. And sometimes that's hard for us to just wait and say, okay, <laughs> Lord, have your way in this life. So this morning I want to ask you a question before I get into the sermon. Is, is who of you have ever needed a letter of recommendation? It's quite a few of you. So you've needed, who of you um, were maybe a bit nervous about that letter? Maybe you've left a job, you know, <laughs> and, and, you, and you didn't leave so well. And, and now you have to ask for this letter of recommendation from this person. And you don't know what they're going to write on that thing. Sometimes when you, when you get access to that letter later and you can read it, you go like, wow, you know, pretty impressive. Is this how this person saw me? And the amazing thing sometimes about a letter of recommendation is that people see stuff in us that we don't. And when they put that in on paper, it... Um, it sort of changes our lives and uh, brings us, you know, we, we did an exercise years ago. We must maybe do it again where um, we were in a small group and the, the small group leader said uh, they, they stuck papers on our backs, all of us. And then you have to write on that paper what you see on that person's life. Now, I don't know about you, but we all sort of walk around with an idea of who I am, Right. You know, and, and most of us probably is that space where we, we don't feel so good about ourselves. No, hopefully not most of us. Okay? But there's days that we don't feel so good about ourselves, right? 
Okay, let's just put it there. Um, and, and people will write on uh, your back what they see in your life. And, and I remember at that point I was, um, let's just call my self-esteem wasn't in a good space. And uh, I remember fearing turning around and reading this little paper because everybody was going to see what I was seeing. And so I, I went into that really, really reluctantly. I mean, and now plus that I must now think, you know, what I see. But, but that's kind of easy because you're like, you know, this oak's cool and you write all these amazing things on the people's lives. And, and I remember when we took them off and I started reading what people saw. I, had, I, I actually started crying. I was like, what? Who's this guy? And people see that. And I, and I believe as, you know, as we, we walk before the Lord, and that's why we have community is so that I can remind you who God says that you are. Because sometimes we can see that more than what we our, ourselves can see it. 2 Corinthians 3 verse uh, 1 to 3 says this. Uh, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? En ek gaan my bril kry. Ah, is dit wat is dan? Hopefully that will help. So Paul is writing here and he says, listen, do I need a letter of recommendation from you? So he's asking a question to them. And he says, you yourselves are our letter of recommendation. Written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us. Written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human heart. Obviously referring there to the, the Ten Commandments. But he makes a powerful statement here and he's saying, listen... Do I need a recommendation here when you are actually the letter of recommendation? And when I read this, it kind of struck me. And, and, and you know, one of the things that I felt in the fast that God clearly showed me, I saw a picture of a veil being lifted. Um, and obviously thinking of when Jesus died, that veil was torn and gave us access to the Holy of Holies. But I saw this picture of this veil being lifted off of this person um, and where God is doing something new. So I believe in this season that we are stepping into, we need to be open to receive what God is doing. Now, as we are sitting here, you know, how did the gospel come to you? You know, was it on a church camp? Who, who got saved on a church camp? All right, nobody. Who was it a friend that told you about Jesus? One, two. If you're confused, just check your database. You know, who got saved in the church? How did the rest of you get saved? The parents. The parents. Oh, that's a good one. All right. Who, what else? Strangers. Strangers. Some strange dude. Teachers. Okay, that's awesome. Teachers have an impact. What, what else? Missions. Ah, okay, cool stuff. Okay. Do you realize that your life is a letter of recommendation of that person's ministry? I got saved was dating a young lady and her mom sat me down the one night and said, so dude, obviously mothers and are concerned. Who's this lady dating a girl and where's he going to lead her to? And, and she went, listen, what is happening to you? And I gave my life to Jesus that night. And, and I believe that my life, like what Paul is writing here, is a letter of recommendation, is a testimony of that woman's ministry, of her faith in pursuing God and saying, Lord, 
I'll take the boldness and ask this young man where he's going. You know, teachers encountering us, strangers walking up to us uh, in the road. If you've led people to, to Christ next, you know, on, a, on, a, on the street or something, that you went on missions. Uh, okay, says, we should do that more. What are we doing? But our lives are, were impacted by people at some point. I remember Loret's brother um, was, there was a guy preaching on TV. And he wasn't even listening to that. They were actually busy moving in. And as this guy was preaching, the Spirit of God just grabbed his attention. And he sat and he listened and he got saved that day in front of a TV, helping to move a friend. How awesome is that? Okay? So God uses various ways to impact our lives and to touch our lives. But as we are sitting here, do you understand that our lives are a testimony or a letter of recommendation of what God has done in someone else's life? I think for me, when I, when I thought of that, I went, wow. You know, the way that I'm walking before God at this stage brings honor to God in her faith, how she was pursuing God at that point. And in a sense, it, it sort of made me think of, listen, man, you know, how am I even honoring her? Not that it's about honoring her, but how's my life counting for the kingdom and the seed that I received so many years ago in my life? So if our lives are a testimony or a recommendation, we can definitely walk in boldness because we have received the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if we continue reading in 2 Corinthians 12, uh, 3 verse 12 to 15, it says, Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We have received grace. We have received the hope so we can walk in boldness. We can be very bold at this time. You know, and I think maybe the devil has got us into a bit of a lull that we are not very bold. If you ever met a very bold person, not me. <laughs> but people that are bold are almost sometimes intimidating, aren't they? You know, because they, they're not making excuses for what they're doing or saying. They are just going for it. And in Christ, we can be very bold. Because we have such a hope. You know, what we have received, the grace, the love of God, is not something small or insignificant. It's not just something in this journey on this world that, you know, it's kind of just there. It is the very thing that makes us bold. You know, even when in, in Acts, when the Holy Spirit came, He, he gave them boldness to pre preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this morning... I, wanna, I want us to just grab hold of that and say, but, but I can be bold. I don't have to be timid or drawn back or anything. I can be bold because of the hope that I've received. You know, in the couple of weeks past, we, we spoke about abiding in the vine and so on. But as we are abiding, as we are drawing from God the vine, let that sort of translate into boldness for the Lord. Okay, see, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. Now, that, that scene there is where God went to, uh, Moses went to God on the mountain, and when he returned, his, his, his face was shining, and they sort of put a veil over him at that point. And Paul is referring to that here now. And let's re read further in verse 13, 14. He says, But their minds were hardened. For to this day, uh, when they read the old covenant, that, that same veil remains unlifted. Because only through Christ it is taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. You know, and, and, and I believe... Even as I saw that vision, 
And as I was sharing this morning, and, and I, I suddenly realized the two is related, I didn't, didn't necessarily plan this. Um, but they, there's a veil of things that, that the way of doing, that the Israelites keep on pressing into those things. And they are not allowing God, they are holding so onto the law that they are missing what God is doing through Jesus Christ. And this morning, I believe God just wants to get us to that place where, you know, we also almost um, reevaluate even where we are in Christ. In that we are not missing anything that He has in store for us in the future. That God wants to take this veil and He wants to lift it off of us. The things that are hindering us, that are holding us back, that are causing us to draw back and say, no. In verse 16 of 2 Corinthians 3, it says, But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Who here has turned to the Lord? All right, that looks good. Do you know that the veil has been lifted? That we are no longer supposed to walk in the old things, the old way of doing. The veil was removed. When we come to God, you know, I, at this time, I'm also almost in a space where I'm going, Father, don't let me miss anything that you have in store for the future because I'm holding on to stuff that I should actually just move on from. Because you did things in a certain way or you came through in a certain way in the past or whatever. And then I'm sort of holding on those things because that's how God works. And, and, and I don't want to miss anything in him at this point because I'm used to doing things in a certain way. I don't want to, I want to, don't want to be caught in that trap of religiously serving the Lord. I don't want to be stuck in that space where... God is moving forward and I go, no, it's not him. I want to recognize where my father is moving at the moment. As that veil is lifting. So, so in a sense, I'm going, you know, I want to turn to the Lord in a new and a fresh way almost at this time. And so, Father, remove the veil, the things that conceal your truth, the things that conceal what you are doing. Remove those things from my life. I have been saved. I know that. But please don't let my flesh dictate where, what my spirit should do. I want to get rid, get rid of the things of the flesh. I want to, you know, like Romans say, walk by the spirit. And not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Because here's the truth. We so easily default to the flesh. We are dragging this thing with us. But I don't want to submit to it. And I'm going, Father, as I am before you, lift those veil, that veil off of me. Lift off the stuff that is keeping me from experiencing um, what you have at this time. You see, when we turn to the Lord, Romans 7.38 says, Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, out of his heart, will flow rivers of living water. That's what I desire at this time. Is that rivers that are bubbling up, that there's, there's overflow, that it's not just you know, rivers that are there to, 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 to sort of keep me alive, but that rivers will bubble up over me by the Spirit of the Lord and will flow to others, that that life of Scripture will just not, not just stay with me, but it will flow to those that God is placing around me. And you know, and even as I was thinking about that, I thought, I thought, what is the driest place on earth? Do you know what's the driest place on earth? Huh? A desert. Okay, guys, so which desert? Sahara. Sahara. No. <laughs> uh, it's the Atacama Desert. There's a picture. It's there, okay? It's in South America covering 1,600 uh, kilometers. Uh, the strip next to Wait, wait, handle. Okay, lost my Okay. 
That's what it looks like. Chachovia. There's a lot of nothing. Do you notice? Okay, there's a bit of water there. I, I, I'm not, but I think that's, uh, those, those waters there are, are salt pans. It's not nice water. Not that we can live it. That's the driest place on earth. It gets less than one millimeter of rain a year. You know how little that is. There's no rain that falls. The Atacama Desert occupies 105,000 square me, uh, kilometers. It is the driest desert, uh, non-polar, it's the driest non-polar desert in the world, as, as well as the only true desert, because it receives less than one millimeter of rain in a year. Would you say it's a dry place? I think so. It is kind of... If you go in there, what's the one thing you have to pack? Definitely. Yes. Because if you're going to wait for the one millimeter of rain, you're going to... You know, there's places there that they say, and I don't know who checked it, but it hasn't received rain for 500 years. Now, I'm wondering who's the 500-year-old guy that can tell us that information, but apparently there are places there that haven't received rain for 500 years. But when it rains... It looks a bit different. Put up that next picture. Look at that. And the next one. Can you imagine that's what a desert can look like? That's what our lives look like when we receive the rain of the Holy Spirit in our lives. When the veil is lifted from your life. When God encounters us, things are different. And this morning, you know, I don't want us to get stuck in a space we are not, where we are not allowing the reign of God's Spirit to fall on our lives. Where we go, God, let it rain. Let it rain in my life. And here's the thing. How will I know when that rain comes? It's when things look different. When things change. When things are transformed. When there's life. You know, when you look at that desert, uh, you would say there's no life. But when the rain comes, everything changes. I mean, we, here we, we, many people drive lots of kilometers when it's the, the flower season to very dry places even just here around the corner but when you get there it's the most incredible display of beauty and I believe as we allow the spirit of God to, to just work in our lives we will see that change in 2 Corinthians 3.17 says now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. And I think we need to remind ourselves that we are free. That we are sons and daughters of God and we are free. We must become very bold. Very bold. Because we are free. You know, when I read that portion of scripture, I had that... Um, that picture of William Wallace. What's that movie? Braveheart. Now we call it freedom. And he was, he was refusing to be bound. And I think this morning, in a sense, I want us to grab hold of that and say, God, you have set me free. And I refuse to be in bondage of stuff any longer you have made me free freedom will lead to boldness and that boldness will change life lives see when we are free we will walk around differently and god will work through us differently because we are not bound and through that process 
people's lives will be changed. We can live boldly because we are free. So who here is bold in their Christianity? Do you want to be bold? Yes, I think we all want to be bold. And I think we need to remind ourselves that we are free. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is freedom. 2 Corinthians 3.18 And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is spirit. So I guess my question this morning is, what are you beholding? Because what we are beholding will be what we are changed into. And what the spirit of the Lord here wants to do, he wants to unveil God's glory to us. But I need to behold him with that unveiled face as God removes that veil from our lives. I need to behold His glory, His majesty, His power. You see, when we behold the glory of God, what happens? God changes, right? No. We change. And then as we've come through the fast, and as we've heard God say that He's, he's breaking down walls, and there's rebuilding of walls, and there's new fresh things coming, you know, Lorette shared a scripture where, um, where they were bu busy rebuilding the walls. And, and obviously looking at the task, it looked like this mammoth task. But it's, it says that they, that they strengthened their hands for this great task. And we need to uh, engage at this stage what God is about to do. We need to strengthen our hands spiritually to engage what God is doing at this point. And then I love that last bit. For, the, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. You see, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is liberty. I can walk in that boldness that He has for me. You see, if I'm not beholding the Lord, well, when I behold the Lord, I am changed. But the opposite is also true. If I'm not beholding Him, I will change into that which I am beholding, which I am pursuing, that which I am running after. So I guess there's a place where I have to sit down and, 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 and reevaluate. And maybe now, more than ever, saying, Father, what are you wanting to do in this new season? John 7, verse 38 to 39 says, Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit whom, tho whom those who believe in him were to receive. We want to receive the Holy Spirit. We want to walk by the Holy Spirit. We want to see that overflow, that rivers of living water. And I don't know, maybe you're sitting here this morning and you feel, you know, the last season that you've been dry. You have not experienced the freedom of God that he has for you. Or maybe like me, you're saying, Father, let me not miss what you have in store for me. Let me not limit you even through what I've seen in the past, but let me not limit you for what you are about to do. Isaiah 58, 11 to 12 says this, and the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in a scorched place, in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters does not fail. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets to dwell in. I love this, that God is saying, listen, I will be like a well-watered garden. He will guide me continually. I will see his face. I will understand what he's about to do. He will satisfy your desire in a scorched place. Even if I go to that desert, he will sustain me. And I believe God wants to do this in our, in our lives right here, 
right now. To let that rain fall. That our gardens, our, our, uh, that way we will be well-watered gardens. Uh, I remember when the drought was going. Um, if you've ever been in Joburg in the winter, I mean, there's, there's no green grass. It's just, it's just brown. And that is what mine looked like during the drought at home. This is the first year that I actually have a hint of greenness uh, because I can actually water my garden. And I believe, you know, even as I, if I look at my garden, how it's flourishing at the moment because I can give it more water. As we pursue God from this place, as we walk with the Lord, we need to allow Him to water us so that we can flourish, that we can be bold, that we can become everything that He is calling us to be. Galatians 5.1 says this, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. We have been set free. But if we submit again to the things that was, that used to be, we will become slaves again. And I do not believe that is God's desire for us. You see, even that picture that I have there of that lion, he's not confused about his freedom. He knows he's free. In actual fact, he's so free, don't mess with him. I would say he walks around there that field very boldly. Because he's free. But also because he understands who he is, who God has made him to be. He knows he's the king of the jungle in that sense. You see, saints, by the Spirit of the Lord, we are the sons of and daughter of the Most High God that dwell in this earth right now. And we need to, with boldness, pursue the Lord more than ever before. So I don't know what the Lord is busy doing in your life at the moment. What is busy shaping and maybe getting rid of. But this morning I want to urge you, I want to ask you not to hold on to stuff that might hinder you from experiencing him in fullness for the next season. To allow God to come and remove those things that is no longer necessary, that maybe is not pleasing to him, that, that, that just needs to not be there. And to say, Father, have your way in me. Have your way in me, Lord, so that I can live boldly in this earth. That I can walk, not by my flesh. Here's the thing. You know, I think in, in, in the flesh, many of us will, will be timid or, or, you know, not easily do stuff. But I believe as the Spirit of the Lord comes upon us, we will be bold. We will be different. Can you imagine what this world would look like? If we really walk around boldly with the gospel, with the freedom, with the love of God, and we allow the Holy Spirit to minister through us day and night, sure, it's going to look different. So on, on, on the grounds of what God is saying to us in the, during the fast and so on, I just want to urge us to, to pursue God in a new way. To lay down those things that are not, or that's hindering us from pursuing Him. And to follow Him with all our heart, our mind, and your strength. Let's pray.